This conference will now be recorded. That's, that's never been uh, discharged and there's no plans to discharge it in the near future. Um, um, uh, but again, if, if, if it were, then it would be, it would be post-treatment. And, I, and the, the treatment doesn't seem to care if you give it a little bit of total nitrogen or a lot or a little bit of total phosphorus or a lot. They're getting it down to those same numbers regardless. Um, so if, if it were discharged, it would be part of sort of site water balance. But again, the, the, the idea right now is if we discharge, it would be sort of stormwater related. Like let's, let's, let's maintain, you know, like we just discharged whatever it was, right? 200 million gallons. We, we don't want to really accumulate that again. That, that would suck. And so it would be nice if we could, you know, slowly discharge treated uh, um, a water to maintain where we are, tread water until we have a long-term solution to this. Um, so um, anyway, in the so I guess the, the summary is no, we have not discharged that full process water. Um, if we did, it would be fully treated and only in small amounts. Um, and again, that that those fully treated amount uh, concentrations right now are about four milligrams per liter total nitrogen, one milligram per liter total phosphorus. Not the numbers that you've heard from. The the, pro, uh, the 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 ponds themselves. Any other questions or comments for Mark? This is Aaron Brown. Can I ask you a quick question? Absolutely. <laughs> hey Mark, congrats on the new position, by the way. <laughs> Our condolences, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Can you um can you speak any to what the state's response is for some of the other locations around the, the bay as far as inspections, or are you just focusing right now at Piney Point? So do you mean the the the, the monitoring of the of what the effects of the discharge or other maybe just clarify? the the current status of the other ponds holding ponds that we have in close proximity to the bay i've heard a lot about Pawnee point but i haven't read as much as far as ensuring increased if anything's been doing uh being done to increase inspections to make sure that other ponds aren't setting themselves up for a similar situation yeah so that, it's a great question uh there, there certainly is a renewed focus um uh uh, in, in the department right now on on not just in, in and around the bay but but statewide there's something like 25 of these you know they and we we clearly need to have sort of a longer term vision for how we're going to manage those and reach some kind of closure the, this innovative tech uh, uh, effort that we're doing is sort of a pilot study not just for piney point but for elsewhere as well um, and they're working out a ton of bugs. I mean, the first the first few weeks, you know, were, were I mean, imagine like you've been in chemistry class, like at, in a beaker, it's really easy. At, at these scales, it's much, much, much more difficult. And what they're doing right now is working out the bugs of of doing benchtop chemistry at this scale. So we're hopeful that that the things we learn and they learn, most importantly we can apply towards some of these other problems as we as we seek permanent closure. Um, but I think it would be incorrect to say there's a ton of focus on those others right now. We've been very focused on Piney Point. That's the immediate concern. But again, the things we're learning and the things we're being reminded of are, are resulting in sort of a longer vision towards how we can better manage these at the state level. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Mark? Uh, I just want to reiterate my thanks to the region, um, you know, for the tremendous response, and also just thank my staff. You know, since March 26, it's been all hands on deck. The times I know both my staff and your staff are probably working hour days on this event. So, um, you know, it's unfortunate that it's occurred something that is definitely preventable. Uh, and now moving forward, you know, full and final closure of the site, I think everybody who's mentioned in the region, I think we should strive for that. Um, as, as Mark mentioned, you know, the immediate concern for us as an SU program was the amount of nutrient loads that went into Tampa Bay. Um, had some great coordination and uh, analyses to understand for where the things might uh, impact some of the Bay resources and you know, the ongoing monitoring will hopefully give us a bit of perspective on what's going on with the interim and longer term impacts from the start. Um, I 
as you all know, we start to go list that information in that uh, environmental monitoring dashboard. Again, kudos to the staff for quickly getting that up and running, um, working with you all individually as agencies who are providing that information as far as we can. And then just trying to clearly communicate all that information to the public. Um, the, the response, again, has been measurable in terms of uh, everyone up, all hands on deck from uh, multiple amount of agencies responsible for this uh, discharge. I think there's rightful anger in terms of you know, how we got to this point and not wanting to see uh, the current healthy phase condition impacted by events like this. But, uh, again, I think the focus of fully closing down the site with uh, as little impact to the bay as possible from the remaining burden of wave flow that's, that's still in play uh, should be everyone's focus. And I'm glad that we have great communication with Mark and um, both the, the county staff who are on site to really understand uh, what the full measure of closure means uh, for that facility. So I, I don't want to drag in at any point longer than it has to, but you know, I know there's ongoing conversations about how we the question that Aaron brought up is there are about 22 or 25 other uh, lake facilities in watersheds of sensitive estuarine um, coastal areas throughout the state of Florida. So uh, if that's a conversation that the region needs to have on um, how we do their job in that facility in the future and fully close them out, I think that's a discussion we need to have. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there. But again, want to recognize all, all my staff who responded to this event. Um, you know, Mark has such a tremendous team developing that oversight that for world. Gary and Sheila have been out uh, coordinating enhanced macro and seagrass monitoring in and around the site, working with other partners to understand uh, baseline conditions and, and what um, these, these discharges might mean for and spot triggers that are reduced to the it, it doesn't stop there. And our internal team of just handling probably about 50 to 60 different media requests over, over the past month, uh, Joe Whalen and Maya has been tremendous in that respect. So, again, from a, uh, an all hands on deck effort, it, I know it has touched all your agencies in this way. Again, these things um, can be avoidable. For the record, that we have uh, Miss Sarah that is uh, filling in for uh, Mr. Sullivan. So we do have a form now. Great, thank you, Ron. So, um, given that, do we have uh, any other changes to the agenda? And hearing none, we will move on to item two approval of the minutes from the February 12th. 2021 asset board meeting is the Russian approved those minutes. 
I do have one question, Ron. The uh, I related to buying point. Has there been those of us who have been monitoring and doing field work and all of that, and obviously encouraged additional costs in operating? Um, has there been a similar increase in operating for the estuary program anywhere? The staff are tracking their time since the beginning of the planning point when they started doing the planning point work. They have been tracking their time out in the field and their additional time, more time for the pay series of wages to go back and, and recover those costs now. So we have been tracking our time, but right now it's primarily being covered by our EPA grant for okay. um, Any other discussion motion to um, recommend the policy board accept the 2021 mid-year budget? Motion from Alex, second from Rob. Any further discussion? Uh, any opposition? All right, motion carries. Uh, next item six. Approval of the final 2022 red So, uh, you see in the draft of our work plan at the February board meeting, and this is our, our final proposed work plan from this new fiscal year 2022 that starts for us on October 1. Uh, this is our formal application to EPA for federal appropriations to get a national electric program that are then matched with your local uh, green contribution. Uh, from our partners. So not much has changed since I, I uh, we presented that draft at the February meeting. Uh, I do want to just mention that we do present the uh, uh, interval contributions in two ways. In the uh, uh, final document, that's because the interval agreement updates that have been proposed have not been fully executed and adopted by all the partners. So once that takes place, we will uh, amend our application to EPA based on the contributions. So we present contributions from the partners based on the existing 2021 interlocal agreement um, distribution, and also present it um, once the new interlocal agreement is fully executed, um, just for, for clarity and, and to highlight that. These tables 2C5A um, in the work plan for on page 50 are the, the um, these are the contributions from each of the partner based on the current intellectual agreement um, until the update is fully executed. Uh, these new contributions wouldn't take effect. So that affects both the, the total amount of contribution for this year 2022 and our in time. Um, based on the uh, So in life, we also present the expenses anticipated. Uh, again, not much has changed in the proposed project that we presented uh, back in February, other than changing some of the funding amounts for the project, basically the contracted technical project, looking at implementing the habitat master plan, and also part of research mission. And this is uh, potentially the Contribute towards TBIRT this year. There's, there's two projects in particular that have focus and application in Tampa Bay that we'll be contributing some resources from the work plan um, that would also help us make um, the match contributions needed for the water management districts for that TBIRT contribution this year. So I just wanted to mention that to you all uh, as a, a, a slight uh, update of what we presented in the draft version, but other than that, the project. That would mean the same. And, uh, I would be happy to entertain any questions you might have on the, the work plan. Our plan moving forward is to, um, once fully accepted by the policy board, submit this to EPA based on the current and local agreement contributions. And like I said, once the uh, updated interlocal is fully executed, we'll be forward into the fiscal year, September 3rd, we just send an amendment to our application. Questions or comments for Evan? 
All right, Harry, not that there are uh, three parts to this um, action item. Uh, see if we can bump them up. Part A, as written in your agenda, is the right hand policy board for the final FY 2022 U.S. EPA annual work plan and budget. Part B is to recommend policy board authorize the executive director to submit final FY 2022 U.S. EPA annual work plan to the EPA Region 4 as a new U.S. EPA cooperative agreement. And then Part C is to recommend the policy board to authorize the executive director to submit a budget amendment to the U.S. EPA once the interlocal agreement is fully executed by all parties. Any questions on that? Okay, right, Mr. Entertain a motion, Rob? So moved. Second. Motion by Rob, second by Howard. Is there any one opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. You know how much easier it goes when. <laughs> <laughs> Item seven, private sewer, private sewer laterals and social marketing campaign concept model. Um, so, you all might recall that um, we have entered into an agreement with Marketing for Change uh, to implement a project to encourage homeowners to voluntarily replace their private sewer laterals. Um, that agreement is funded with support from the Pinellas County Stormwater Wastewater Partnership, as well as uh, a 319 age grant from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Um, we also had earmarked additional resources, the amount of $50,000 in a prior work plan to contribute uh, to that campaign as well. And we're now at a point where we're ready to encumber those funds and we're recommending that we go ahead and add that $50,000 amount onto the contract with Marketing for Change. Um, the idea is now that we have the social science research and the, the survey stakeholder working group uh, in place, we understand um, what we need to do in order to effectively market this campaign. So, these resources would go to develop additional collateral, website copywriting, branding, um, and then to enhance the ad buys uh, that we were already planning to do with uh, marketing for change. And so because this is above the $25,000 threshold that um, Ed is able to just add on to a contract, we're bringing it forward to you all for your consideration. Any questions for Maya? Yeah, right. Um, um, so the 50000 for marketing, how, how much money is in the fund for the private business? Do we know how many people have this problem? And, you know, or, um, yeah. So there is, there is no money right now that is allocated for like a rebate program, for example. This is simply a campaign to enhance people's understanding of private sanitary sewer lateral lines and um, to encourage them to get them inspected and if they are if they need repair or replacement to pursue those activities. So right now, because there are the only places that have rebate programs available right now, Gulfport has tapped theirs out and St. Petersburg um, has a small scale pilot in, in um, Nellis Point neighborhood. Those are the only places where that occurs. So this is all based on voluntary actions that would be paid for by the homeowner. So trying to make that more palatable and encourage them to, to just maintain their property as they ought to with their own funds. So there's no money for rebates at this point. We have been coordinating um, throughout the region, but we're working most closely with Pinellas County uh, to, to consider different policy options to address this problem because in Pinellas County utilities, for example, as much as 70% of the INI in their system is coming from lateral sewer lines that are either publicly or privately owned. So we know that this is a significant part of what's contributing to sanitary sewer overflows within Tampa Bay watershed. Um, and so that's why we're focused there. I just participated in a Board of County Commissioner's workshop with Pinellas County. And they're considering a variety of different policy options including a, re a rebate program, um, a county-funded find and fix program, as well as um, other, other options like incorporating these requirements for homeowners to conduct these 
inspections and repair and replacement if they are going through the permitting process. For example, if they're uh, doing a substantial renovation or rebuilding the property, um, or they, they're also considering um, point of sale restrictions. Uh, so if you're selling a home requiring that you have an inspection, it doesn't seem like there's as much support for that option, but we are using this research not just to market uh, the, the correct behaviors within the community, but also to help inform those government entities that are interested in pursuing policies. We're trying to help make sure that the policies they pursue are effective and sort of taking into account meeting where the residents are at. The only place in our watershed that currently has a grant incentive that's active is St. Petersburg.
Any other questions or comments from audience? I have one question I apologize if I missed it. But you know, one of the things that took off or made Solar take off were these co-ops. And so is there is there an avenue there for like vinyl co-ops where you know neighborhoods bundle together, they'll get a price cut and then you can work through one contract here. So that's Sort of the concept behind one of the one of the policy options that Pinellas County is considering. Um, what Pinellas County, their find and fix that, that they're considering is actually they haven't decided, you know, if they're going to pursue that option. But the idea is that when the county utility is doing work in an area that has high I and I in the public collection system that's been determined through flow metering. They would have an agreement in place with a contractor to go in and line and repair the pipes. But what they would also then do is go to that same surrounding area that they've already got a contractor mobilized and, and say, hey, um, if you give us permission, you know, to scope your lateral line, and if it needs to be repaired, you can get in on the action with this contractor who's already mobilized. We have a price and we can pool the resources. Um, there's some question about who pays for that. Is it that the county would pay up to a certain amount? Would the county just take all on that full expense? Um, but the idea is very much that same one of being able to group things up, negotiate for a more effective price, and knock out all that work at one time in those hot spot areas. Um, so, you know, that's that's one of the things that's under consideration. Um, but we're, we're really like at the forefront of ideas for how all the different governments want to handle these things. And so what we have now is some insights into what might work and, and why, what might get over some of those behavioral fears. And, and I think that that is, is one approach that I think, um, you know, could, could work. All right, if, if there are no other comments or questions for Maya, um, this is an action item to recommend the policy board and authorize the executive director to amend the existing contract with bargaining exchange to include about six fifty thousand dollars for additional services. Is there a motion to make that? Great motion. Okay. That's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second is any objection? Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up, Maya also with the approval of the 2021 paper bank ballot legislation fund project. So it's that time of year. Um, we've got a number of really excellent proposals for the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund um, this year, and I want to uh, give a special thanks to, to those of you who made time in your busy schedules when we were in the midst of responding to Pining Point. People were really flexible and, and able to get through um, a, a really strong set of proposals this year in, in order to, to um, provide funding to help Ed make this recommendation. Um, one thing I'd like to note is that the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund, um, it, we did not have as much funding available this year as we typically do. And so Ed, Ed mentioned that we were um, seeking to make up some of that funding shortfall through the work plan. Um, I just want to bring that to your all's attention um, because if there, and just remind you that you know, your contributions to the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund help us meet a challenge grant from the Southwest Florida Water Management District. And so, um, for any for any entities that aren't contributing now, you know, if, if you have space in your budgets to be able to do that, it really helps us bring additional resources down to do um, these projects, which are implementing our. Um, so because of those more limited resources this year, uh, a very competitive, a competitive year, um, you'll see the projects that we're recommending um, funding support for. Um, and one of the things that we're also doing is working with Restore America Estuaries uh, to see if we can secure additional funding um, after the fact to backfill some of those gaps and perhaps let us fund uh, more deep, deeper down into the, the pool of applicants, just for your knowledge. Um, but what we're able to fund and what we're recommending at this point, um, there's a table in your packet that identifies um, what, what, we, what we've selected, um, and you'll see those projects listed below. Um, for the seven projects that we're recommending, 
um, four of them will be managed by the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. The remaining three uh, would, be, would be managed by our partner, Restore Mass Estuaries. Um, the, the motion is broken out in order to accommodate uh, um, necessary abstentions. Um, I, I know that there's at least uh, two that need to get um, to get pulled in order for you all to um, to try to make the motion as clean and simple as possible. But the, you can see all of the information there, and it's kind of just helpful if you have any questions to get. Any questions or comments? No. Yeah. Um, there's one of the recommendations we had was for 96,000. Well, they requested the amount of 96,000, you're recommending 79. Yeah. How is that going to work? I mean, so we did a request for additional information from that partner. The reason that the recommendation is for a lesser amount is because typically the reviewers, um, when looking at the budgets for these proposed projects, this is for the atmosphere and deposition um, project in Old Tampa Bay, the reviewers have been uncomfortable supporting tuition costs. Um, so that's the, that's the additional Yes, but I, I, I will say that what we've done is put out a request for additional information. Um, for that applicant to make sure that they're able to conduct the work at this reduced level. We did receive a response from Mary Lux, the, the PI for this project. She indicated that it was very important for her to be able to provide that uh, tuition stipend in order to be competitive to secure the PhD student that would be doing this work. Um, she's indicated uh, a, you know, a potential ability to do the work for less, but you know, did make a case for hoping to, have to secure that full funding amount. Um, but she did also indicate that if needed, she she could perform the work at a reduced staff reduced budget amount. So that's a, you know, up for discussion here today. As long as the work can be done, so during the night meeting, uh, we think that the top of the level may make some of those decisions. I thought that the impacts earlier when they don't see it listed that they're separate items. So with that, to me, it's going to be the same from the turn on and each separate. That would be your call. The district is not stand to join in that. That would be your call. The district does not stand to directly financially benefit from that one uh, at, at this level. So I think John's guidance has been because you're not directly fi financially benefiting that you don't need to abstain. But if you would prefer to, we can note that. Well, we potentially could because it is a um, it's going through our cooperative funding initiative process and it is recommended funding, so if it does get to our that would reduce our cost. So we would benefit from that. And that was one of the points that we came from uh, it's our, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think again that's probably your call. Do you feel more comfortable abstaining than by all means do that? So can we take that as a separate item then? I guess what we'll do is we'll add we'll add the abstention from the district, so we'll add another one of Felipe Association and note that um, the district is abstaining in here. So to be clear, Maya, we can vote on things as they are in the agenda. We just put them Yes, because I yes, I've added another one in there. So so when if you accept the motion, we'll be noting that um Dr. Welling is abstaining from the Robinson project. Um Ms. Sarah will be abstaining from the economic valuation and Ms. Bendixson would be abstaining from Felipe Bay. So it, those individual items. So then so do we want to do these one at a time? Do we still build the A, B, and C? I was online provide a recommendation on that. I think as my other abstention would be reflected in minutes if we just want to so move what was just stated by both uh my I think that's appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Is there a motion? Okay. I heard I heard a motion. Rob, make the motion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by Very good. Um, so, any opposed to those? Any opposed to those abstentions? There are not. 
how we can vote as it appears in the agenda. <clears throat> and we'll do these, we'll break these out separately into item A. Recommend the following board approve you know, the table one list of recommended projects and budgets for the 2021 Cooper Award as listed there. Uh, is there a motion to recommend that to the policy? Well, there's a motion. No, no. Uh, Any opposition to that? Hearing none, item B is to recommend the policy board to authorize the executive director to enter into contracts for four of the seven recommended projects as listed there in the agenda. Is there a motion to recommend that to the policy board? Well, we'll all right, so there's a motion by Rob, second by Dave. Any opposition? Hearing none, that motion carries. And then excuse me, item C, recommend the policy board authorize the executive director to amend the scope and budget up to $25,000 for the contract if additional funds become available. Is there a motion? Or Motion by Rob, second by Dave, and from our top back to the bottom. If you flip, it's sure. Um, any opposition to that motion? All in favor of the motion? All in motion, Karen. So no opposition. That one looks fun. Um, it always is. <laughs> it always is. So that brings us to item nine on the agenda the executive director and staff. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of items that Linda uh, mentioned during the executive director report, and then I also have uh, Gary and you give the update. So, first, just the status of the interlocal agreement and where, where it stands in terms of the partner um, review and approvals. Uh, I know some of you were initially scheduling. Your account for commissions to um, review the interlocal agreement as to the February meeting as early as April, but finally we have it. So I know there's been delays in the times and everything. Uh, since the February meeting, we did receive some comments from Manatee County for DEP on the, the draft that was approved at the February board meeting. I could bring it up right now, but there was basically two or sorry, three changes. That we incorporated in that approved version. There it is. Sorry. <laughs> um, basically, on page two, eight, and I believe uh, there were some uh, slight additions that are denoted in red text version that we have linked to your packet. My internet connection is not broken. Scroll through it, but. Uh, Don Con, uh, our legal counsel, reviewed those, those corrections and there are all those three different corrections. So there's no further uh, action to be come forward at this point. But we do ask that when you um, move, place these on your agenda for your, your board counsel committee, that they refer to that now. This meeting packet can all follow any of this meeting once uh, again. Acknowledge by all the board next week. So, you know, some of you have started to schedule that to be happy to provide any updates on that stream program. Um, interlocal agreements on updates that are reflected in the new version and any other um, information that uh, the board might want to see in the future, especially you know, given the timing point. Uh, so, I just wanted to give you that update. I don't know if Paul had any questions on that. Um, like I said, we'll follow up after the board meeting. Uh, with this uh, final version, or that you all are working through your individual um, teams so that we can fully implement this. By the target date, um, we put the target date of September 30th. So once we get individual hard approvals, there's the next step for the staff that we actually have to follow along all the people to the signature date for counting for this single approval. So we need a little bit of time to fully do that. So and 
for those that have already got them, do they need to go back to the shoulder? So the just get back what was technically the same version? I believe Don's online, I think, as long as the um, executing authority is okay with the this new version of the superior corrections, then we can go to the signature page is then changed. But we would file any this version that presents that. Any other questions, Are you going to not do that if you feel comfortable that they want to be any substantive changes? Yes, at this point, yes. Um, you know, we, we asked for comments all the way back at the November board meeting. We received um, a number of comments from each of the partners um, by the end of January that there were some remaining comments that Manage County wanted to make once they saw the final version. And also, um, we definitely see the DEP at 32 of the November. So, at this point, I'm fairly comfortable that all the partners that had ample opportunity to review provide their comments back. So, uh, so um, it's my hopes that, yes, this would be the fully executed version that we submit. Other questions about the parallel um, It will also want to you now about that. Uh, also, bring to the attention of, of the board that we are, will be a uh, recipient of funds from a settlement agreement that was reached between the city of Largo and the third party uh, in litigation with them uh, based on uh, some sanitary sewer workloads that they, they had in their jurisdiction. So, this is similar to uh, settlement agreement uh, money we received in response to similar litigation that we worked with City Six here for a few months. We were sitting on about hundred thousand dollars each month from that uh, settlement agreement, um, and that project is supposed to be directed towards that money is supposed to be directed towards a beneficial project in the old Tampa Bay watershed that we were used in nineteen ninety for uh, provide some habitat restoration. The fire detection program at this point is to apply the letter back to the department of this settlement agreement that we would use to support the work we've documented in that settlement agreement. But we have been in preliminary discussion with Pinellas County to be pursuing the project on uh, Channel 5, which is a channel I system that runs uh, parallel to the St. Pete Clearwater Airport and also. Center Sound community, which also received some um, runoff from, from the Center Sound Golf Course community, uh, where the city of Largo ultimately um, uh, provides reclaimed water to that, that golf course. So the, the county is pursuing a project that we uh, uh, initially de developed conceptual design in the past, lowering that beer structure that um, is just upstream of the Mango Fringe um, that borders Old Tampa Bay. There are also some habitat restoration um, associated with that following of that beer just to enhance the tidal connectivity of that system. So we were proposing to take to use that potential um, that those funds from the settlement agreement to enhance that project in terms of the habitat restoration associated with that project. Um, so just again wanted to bring that to the attention of the boards that uh, there's some additional funds that we would be able to uh, help provide to a project that has some. Last thing I wanted to mention, we've also been uh, approached by Ducks Unlimited uh, and their cor corporate partner, the Mosaic Company, uh, to also receive some funds to direct towards a project that has actually already uh, been approved for, uh, for prior keeper funding. Um, Ducks Unlimited, through Mosaic, want to contribute about $80,000 towards the track route restoration project um, that was funded in the keeper call. Uh, this is a water management district project that's looking at uh, um, restoring some old um, fish farms adjacent to Kitchener and Hill, Hill, Hill Road Bay. Um, because this project has already funded through keeper, what our anticipated plans are is to get the board receptive to accepting that money of that that we would provide um, that money towards that project, and that would be a already obligated funds that we have 
that's what I'm saying is that I wouldn't preach.
program that Ms. Ford had I know she's online, but we're a little bit. Go ahead, Jessica. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. This is Jessica Lewis. Um, looking forward to it on Monday. It's a busy end of the week for, for me right now, but I am looking forward to coming on board on Monday. Thank you so much. So just to be clear, you're looking forward to shadowing Rob? <laughs> of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. Uh, Thank you very much. Please have some staff reports. Um, Gary, thanks, Ben. Uh, a couple of things real quick on basis data. The call for abstracts is going out next week. Please encourage your staff to submit as appropriate and available. Uh, thanks very much to all the session and workshop meetings I've been working with over the last couple of weeks to get the announcement ready. And the steering committee has been in there. I'm uh, working for some um, excellent development for everybody. We have about $23,000 in sponsorships today and some discussions with uh, several partners who will enhance that and maybe help us reduce the registration costs, provide a uh, few scholarships. We much appreciated to all, all the folks um, that could have provided those, those, uh, those sponsorships. Um, some, of, some, most of you are aware that the 2020 Swift Mud provisional data for seagrasses was released last month at a Southwest Florida seagrass meeting. Uh, Tampa Bay was reported to have lost about 5,400 acres between 2018 and 2020. This is the lowest level we've seen since 2012. Um, both Pool Tampa Bay and Potential have lost about 3,200 acres, current estimates. Uh, from the change maps that, that we saw during the presentation provided by Chris Anastasiu, the, uh, the losses were for, for Old Tampa Bay all around the bay, but particularly on the Feather South Coast. And we're concerned about traditional uh, transitions to Calerpa, um, both there and in several other locations. We're going to be discussing this at the next uh, TAC meeting. Uh, Chris will be providing a recap of result, results, and I'll be talking about some of the um, the current the ongoing research and some of the plant work that we're that we are going to be starting in the next several months to try to turn the, turn this around. However, on the flip side, you know, we can't lose recognition of the great work that's gone on before us. We're still around 35,000 acres versus uh, 22,000 in, in 1982, but it's a wake up call that we need to make sure that we continue to work with the Life Tree Management Consortium and all of our private public partners. Uh, to, uh, to move that I can do. Happy to take any questions. Question for Sarah. Yeah, this is not a state employee. This is something that we want to do. So, what is going on? Is the way that we need to be concerned about the cost of getting the first thing? The issues we're having in the upper bay in terms of the general seagrass heads are, are tied to very closely tied to some of the lower quality conditions that have been observed in the bay to a lesser extent to a bit, but you know, we know we have issues. I didn't want to give Joe an opportunity to give some highlights because we discussed too much in my point. Joe, yeah, I gave you control. If you want to give a little highlight of all that could be in the past month related to that. Sure. Uh, can folks see my screen right now? Yes. Great. Uh, yes, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Ed, for passing the control over. Uh, like Ed mentioned, I'd like to give a very brief overview, uh, kind of jumping back to Piney Point quickly. 
Um, but looking at it uh, in terms of staff capacity to manage the communications of an issue like this, and I, as uh, the staff has mentioned already in this meeting, I think it was quite a feat to manage the flurry of media requests we have, but also just uh, manage some of our, uh, making sure that we communicate to the public at times like this when they, you know, they really need to hear from that source that they trust. So uh, real quick, brief overview. I wanted to mention that, you know, in, in this reporting window that I've chosen from March 29th to April 9th, really when we were receiving uh, a lot of media requests, a lot of messages on social media and things like that, we had ultimately responded to 43 requests. Staff coordinated and completed 30 of those requests, and then we forwarded eight of those left to other partners to try to kick some of the shine to them as well. And those included regional uh, press representatives from places like Bradenton Herald, WMNF, all the way to National Geographic. Uh, in terms of social media, we saw really amazing numbers all across our channels. Uh, instead of going into the you know, hundreds of percentage increases, I'd really just like to mention that we had two major Piney Point updates, uh, posts that we posted on both Facebook and Instagram. And uh, for a you know a regional environmental program, these really captured almost viral nature of uh, being shared over 211 times on Instagram, being shared over 102 times on Facebook, and uh, really just exposing our content to a lot of people and getting that that update that we worked hard on internally uh, in front of the right people. So we're really happy to see those numbers. Our website saw a lot of really great metrics as well, uh, reaching 11,000 impressions, 693 clicks. Um, our link tree, which is essentially a link sharing platform, it's a single static link that we can drop into our uh, social media profiles and then serve up a whole bunch of different links on that platform. Um, that really served us well throughout this this process and this reporting window of getting in and moving in and out a lot of really important links. And you could see there that we had great healthy heartbeats all throughout this window. And then especially towards the end, um, seeing some consistent gains. And one of the links that was on that Linktree platform was the Piney Point Environmental Monitoring Dashboard. And just in this window, we had 270 clicks to that dashboard. Uh, and that, I'm sure, is not a full representation of all of the, the visits we had to that dashboard, but it does give you an idea of just through this one link as served up through our social media channels, we got some great traffic in that reporting window. Um, also, we had 34 new email contact signups. Those are organic signups, people who just went to our, our website and chose to sign up for our email lists. Uh, we had 34 of those. And then on Unsplash, which of course is our photo sharing platform, uh, where we always see great numbers. And a lot of these people probably come without having heard of Piney Point. But uh, just in this window, we saw numbers that far uh, go above and beyond what we normally see in, in less than a month reporting window. Um, so it's, it, you know, that platform is a great way for people to have access to our photos, especially at this time, photos like of seagrass and just some of our uh, programs work. So it was good to have that content readily available for people. And then just to give a cumulative overview from March 30th to today, uh, you know, in total, TBEP has participated in, in around 60 media requests uh, in person, via email, over the phone. And uh, the content of those requests were more than just Piney Point, but we also had opportunities to talk about our Trash Free Waters program, the recent seagrass results, and some microplastics conversations. Uh, in total, our social media channels gained a total of 310 new followers. Uh, if we're looking at the total amount of times that our content had been, ex had been made available to people, or rather showed up on people's timeline, uh, that totals to 43,000 users across Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And of that number, 2,979 uh, 2 users meaningfully engaged with that content. So that's a great number. I mean, engagement is always the thing that we go for, not just impressions. So to see a, a number like that um, in the context of engagement is pretty great. And then, you know, email signups are extremely important because once someone signed up, they're going to be exposed to our newsletters and other important pieces of information moving forward. And in total, we had 86 new contacts sign up uh, in this in that reporting window. So uh, that's a really great number. And, you know, additionally, our, our email marketing uh, open rate and click rate both increased by 5% as compared to the previous month. Um, so, you know, 
ultimately all across the board, we saw some really great uh, metrics and insights. Of course, it came um, through, you know, unfortunate circumstances, but the team was really able to capitalize on that in our in our own way and make sure that we were providing uh, the right information to people in a, as timely a manner as possible. And that's all I have for that. Thanks for your time. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Joe. Any questions for Kevin or Joe? Uh, next item, Ted, is the technical advisory committee. Erin, there, you want to come in? No, Erin has a week. You know, I think we have Erin too. Um, so, as you can see, there are many pages here of activities that the technical advisory committee, um, that the, the team here has, has been working on. Um, obviously, Ed has already mentioned the, the amount of work that has um, been involved in coordinating tiny point activities. And I, I, I in our briefing with uh, Treasurer Douglas, I mentioned that. Um, it was so nice just to have somebody tell us what to do. Instead <laughs> <laughs> of trying to figure out what to do, it was like, well, I can do this. It's kind of like, that's right, I just didn't have to think. It was like, you know, this is what we need you to do. So it's very nice having you guys work with them. Very appreciative. Uh, 
Uh, good morning. Good morning. This is Jan. Um, the CAC met in March. Can you hear me? Um, the CAC met on March 24th, and we had presentations from uh, many grant folks on five five projects, which were really good. Um, we have had a couple of give a day for the bays lately that um, some of our members have attended. Um, we've got two more coming up, one um, next weekend at Fort DeSoto, and then uh, there's one after that in June. And I had, oh, at, Ter at Terracia Preserve State Park in Manatee County, um, which is gonna be an on-water cleanup. Um, we also met, the committee met for the Golden Mangrove Award and made our recommendations um, for those. And we also met this week because we felt like we needed to update the um, the form, the rubric that we were using for judging golden mangrove projects um, to better represent the aspects of the projects that we um, thought were important. Uh, we thought maybe some of the, the categories that we had weren't um, appropriate to all projects and that we should change it up a little bit. So. Um, we did that and we work with Sheila to, to kind of talk about that whole process during that meeting um, so that it'll go smoothly. Um, and we're uh, ready to present to the policy committee um, later on. And that's all I have, I think. Great, thank you, Any questions? Okay, we'll go to Yeah, see my screen and hear my voice? Yes, I can. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to present the results of our study. It's a red tide study that examined the conditions in the five county, Tampa Bay and Sarasota Bay region before, during, and after the red tide event. We looked at 18 measures of community well-being and we used uh, what we hope will be open science methods. So the study can be easily repeated. Uh, we also documented the red tide emergency response of the five counties and then created a draft red tide operations plan and some recommendations. So like hurricanes, extreme red tide events are a hazard that we hope won't return anytime soon, but sooner or later, we need to be ready. So let's recall the massive 2018 red tide event. The severity, the extent, the duration were unprecedented in recent years and received national media attention. 120 miles of coastline in southwest Florida was impacted for 16 months. 
The severe red tide conditions developed in Charlotte Harbor as early as November of 2017. And as shown in this red tide calendar for Tampa Bay, consistently high levels of red tide cells, over 10,000 cells per liter, reached Tampa Bay waters in August of 2018. From there, concentrations rose to more than 1,000 times lethal levels and stayed there for weeks on end. And the results were devastating. Fish and wildlife impacts, we saw a 300% increase in manatee, dolphin, and turtle strandings. Bird hospital admissions were up 300%. Most never made it to the hospitals. And calls to FWC's Fish Hill Hotline were up 400% for the year. 2,178 tons of dead marine life were removed from Tampa Bay area beaches and waters. Coastal tourism was impacted. Manatee County Barrier Island restaurants lost 27% of their gross revenues for the year. And visitor lodging was also down 18% in Manatee County. Boaters opted not to go out as evidenced in a 24% drop in marine fuel sales. And the community at large was impacted as well. 211 calls for social services in Manatee County in particular reached a three year high in October of 2018, especially for food, utilities and housing. We looked at uh, community sentiment and concerns through the lens of social media with the help from Dr. Andrei Skripnikov in New College's data science program. And in an analysis of 17,000 tweets about red tide during this one year period, 69% referenced the environment, 22% referenced health and 9% the economy. But we also wanted to find out what was happening on the front lines of the red tide response. So we interviewed emergency response managers and natural resource managers from each of the five counties of the Tampa Bay and Sarasota Bay region. We also gleaned information from county documents and media reports. With that regional perspective, we were able to identify notable actions and innovations. We could see where there were some gaps and some challenges in the response. And we were able to provide some recommendations for preparing and responding to future red tide. So we use this information. Um, honestly, most, mostly what we learned was from Kelly Hammer-Levy, and we used it to generate red tide response operations plans for each of the five counties, incorporating detailed steps for monitoring and reporting, and for cleanup, for communications, and for records management. So now I want to look at some of the gaps or challenges in the red tide response that we noted, um, some of the highlights and uh, recommendations for possible approaches. First, the declaration of emergency. The governor's declaration of emergency finally came August 13th, weeks after impacts had started. This was the trigger that counties needed to activate a private contractor for debris cleanup because it ensured availability of FTEP grant funds. And there was broad agreement that an earlier declaration of emergency would have resulted in a more robust, effective, and coordinated response. With regard to cooperation, uh, other than sharing situation reports and weekly update calls, counties didn't seem to have a formal process for coordinating response efforts between neighboring counties. And since red tide impacts moved northward up the coast and were spatially patchy even in the affected areas, um, not all the counties were responding to the same intensity at the same time. And finally, emergency management plans. None of the five counties in the Tampa Bay and Sarasota Bay region had a formal red tide emergency response plan prior to the incident. And there was little institutional memory from the last major red tide event in 2005 and 6. So as a consequence, staff were tasked with creating and adapting procedures in real time, which was pretty impressive. There was a lot of innovation and working on the fly, long hours. 
So our recommendations are to develop a process with FDEP for determining what conditions warrant a red tide emergency declaration from the governor in order to try to get it activated early so that there can be a robust response. Also to develop a process or maybe an MOU for cooperation between neighboring counties for mobilizing Gulf and Bay surveillance, equipment and subcontractors in shared water bodies. So to cooperate across county lines and also to develop and adopt countywide red tide response operations plans. Conditions assessment. Um, with regard to data collection, counties, uh, as I mentioned, kind of on the fly, develop their own procedures for daily assessment of conditions offshore, inshore, and onshore, such as uh, estimating debris volume, water color, um, respiratory irritation, and odor. But standardizing these rather subjective qualitative measurements among observers was challenging and wasn't consistent across counties, so not really comparable. With regard to reporting tools, uh, because of the complexity of operations, there were different streams of data being reported to different managers in different formats. And overall, uh, most counties seem to lack a centralized, open data reporting management and visualization tool to handle the whole operation. So our recommendations are to develop regionally standardized procedures and training for open water and shoreline surveillance and assessment, especially for those qualitative indicators, and to develop centralized open data management and visualization tools and training guides or SOPs. In the midst of the crisis, the reporting tools need to be simple and fast for staff to use consistently and the data summaries and visualizations should be easily accessible by leadership. Perhaps the single most important aspect of red tide response, we think, is to prioritize cleanup of the floating debris, tracking those debris masses and removing them before they impact shorelines or sink to the bottom. Besides the obvious impacts to beaches and sensitive coastal marsh, Dead fish left to decay in the water may contribute to a longer red tide bloom, more severe water fouling that may be responsible for seagrass die-offs, and increased long-term nutrient loads in the bay. This was, in fact, Pinellas County strategy, and you can see the payoff. Using a variety of vessels and manpower of local fishermen and charter captains, 1,862 tons of red tide debris were cleaned from Pinellas County waters and beaches. But some counties couldn't get the equipment and staff needed for the magnitude of the cleanup required and to be responsive in all types of locations and conditions. So flat bottom skips, outrigger vessels, trash skimmers, beach rakes, wave runners, blowers, uh, turbidity barriers and soft-sided dumpster bags and of course PPE. All those different types of equipment are, are needed for a full response. So bottom line, we think that it's all about targeting the floating debris. Red tide and mar dead marine life don't stop at the county line, um, but it's a very challenging call of duty. We think it could be easier and more effective with regional cooperation for sharing data, surveillance, equipment, and contractors. And cooperation can lead to more capacity, which can lead to more cleanup, which could reduce nutrient loads in the bay, cleaner beaches and waterways, ultimately a healthier bay and a happier public. We're really pleased that the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council has taken up our recommendations and is gonna take the lead to organize and facilitate cooperation between counties and agencies for future red tide response. In fact, a regional workshop of red tide responders is scheduled for this month, coming up May 25th. We'd definitely like to thank all the scientists who shared their data, the resource managers and emergency managers who shared their time and knowledge to make this study possible. Thanks to our funders, of course, Tampa Bay um, 
Environmental Restoration Fund and the Sunrise Rotary Club Foundation from the Sarasota area. You can download the report, the full Red Tide Impact and Response Summaries at this URL. I'm also dropping them in the chat for those of you online who wanna click through. So that's the super quick summary of a rather large study and I encourage you if you're interested to go take a look. We produced infographics as well that you can download and share showing the impacts for the Tampa Bay region and the Sarasota Bay region. And I'm happy to take your questions. I'm going to have a difficult time hearing you, so if I don't respond, it's because I didn't hear you. I'm not hearing any, seeing any questions yet. Is there anything online? Can you, can you hear me, Jennifer? Yes, I can hear you. So if there are questions, I'll just repeat. Nothing in the room. I don't see any questions. Um, I will say though that just like the estuary programs respond to high employment, you know, if you do something well, it's yours for life. Um, and I, in my approach to this it will, it will always be just do what Kelly tells you. You guys literally wrote the book now, so um, I thought that you would start with it. <laughs> Uh, but I, it is encouraging to see this, uh, this collaborative approach um, through the regional planning council and, and trying to get um, all the sites just like the other sites, trying to get us uh, all talking at the same time in the same room with the same data and information. I think uh, not that anyone's looking forward to a, an active red time season, but I think we will be infinitely more prepared this time. Um, yeah, one comment and one question. I appreciated the presentation. I haven't actually seen it before. Um, Hi, Jennifer. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, this is Leanne Floyd with FWC. Um, I, yeah, we will be a part of your workshop later in this month. Um, hey. tonight. Uh, but I just appreciated the presentation. I hadn't had a chance to see it yet. Uh, and it does, what you're doing speaks directly to um, one of the have task force recommendations that came out a couple of years ago. So we're really um, grateful to see this moving forward. I was wondering which, does it stop at Sarasota County in terms of regionally? How, what's this coverage of the region planning? Yeah, our study covers Pasco, Pinellas, Hillsborough, Manatee, and Sarasota. Those are the five counties. And uh, really, it was uh, primarily limited by their funding sources. But certainly, the methods could be repeated uh, for the whole Southwest Florida region. Right. Okay. Well, that'll be, that'll be helpful. Um, and I sincerely hope we don't have another 2018, but we're kind of looking at similar conditions right now, where we're headed into the rainy season and we have recently high levels of spring is still hanging around in southwest Florida. So, you know, I would say don't take your eyes off the maps right now. Right, and, and I think many of these recommendations uh, apply equally well to um, other HABs uh, and macroalgae blooms, particularly with the uh, possibility for cleanup of, you know, the floating lingvia mats um, and um, other water quality issues. So uh, laying the foundation for uh, sharing the equipment and contractors um, could be important. Yeah, that's a level of response that we have a blue that we are, but the need for that kind of coordinated debris removal response uh, fortunately doesn't come up every single year, which is I think why there hasn't been any um, prior formalized planning Obviously, this is something we're looking at. It's sort of why we need to have an interoperative commission because it's not common 
mind because you're not dealing with it everywhere as part of your workflow. So you need to document the reference and stuff. Well, and, and the coordinate all the contracts. You know, there's a lot of these contractors contract with multiple counties, and whoever gets there first winds up getting the contract. And so the, the how it's all working is one group coordinating those contracts and, and the contractors themselves. Uh, I think will be uh, a bar as well. So we're not we're no longer competing with each other to find something. Just to add to the link, um, you know, there have been conversations with the link you that have been lingering in Madison County, you know, why we take a similar approach. And I think those are important discussions that perhaps have during other type workshops is like when did they cross the natural polluting condition that we need to have an aggregate model to reduce the recycling of these things? Other harmful things that occur. So, um, yeah, I think that's an important conversation of what what's the right response to these these ongoing events. Um, that could be exasperated by industry um, moving forward over the next year. Um, you know, different I, I view in, in terms of the Lindy Wing. They're referring over Chelsea Fair Fed. Probably going to want to have some strict procedures for the contractors to follow or move them so they're not. Just sort of commentary on uh, the, the extra challenges of dealing with these sensitive interbay habitats versus a beach, which is relatively easy to clean, and, and how we might balance those approaches moving forward. Yes, we we did hear that, especially from Hillsboro, uh, which has sort of a lot of uh, you know inside the bay sensitive habitat, and um, they they wish they had you know wave wave runners and leaf blowers to that they could use to to get the debris out from the edge of the um, mangrove swamp and um, make it easier to collect. I think I'll, I'll review the recording of the meeting so I can hear all of, all of the conversation. Unfortunately, go to meeting is what's the recording, so I'm not sure of the quality. <laughs> oh. Okay. But I can brief you the best I can. We'll okay. Bring we'll bring it over. That's right, we've got the workshop too. Um, 
in the state, and that takes us to item number 14 on the agenda, which is the additional packet information. Well, actually, the last two pages of the packet, the uh, first one is a quarterly progress report, which is a reporting requirement that we have with the EPA to provide them progress on our EPA grants. We also provide it to the board um, in the electronic version, the online version. Smart sheet dashboard has uh, hyperlinks all throughout that, that quarterly report where you can drill down and look at the, each of the grants individually. The program right now is managing about $13.5 million worth of projects. That's all I have for that. The last page is the needs, the balance of the needs for 2021, August 13th management board meeting, and the November 12th uh, management board meeting.
Scott, I think you made a very valid point. And I had a conversation with, with Dr. Prager, and I think he understands the optical breadth of the monitoring and they didn't articulate it very well uh, article. And I think from the program regions point of view, all we need to do is align by science. Um, we have a vast array of monitoring information that we're now touting the region to understand baseline conditions and what the ramifications of perturbation in the environment are. And we just got to continue to make that and showcase that to the public. Um, if there's any question of, of, of lack of monitoring in Tampa Bay, um, I think the data and the reporting tools that we've been creating over these past months longer are required at grade repeat. So I think it's a re education process for uh, the Dean of College of Marine Science at USF. Um, I think he notes he's made a faux pas in terms of the monitoring community that's represented here. Whether or not he um, he learns from that, I'm not sure at this point, but you know, I extend a dollar of grant to him uh, and he provided his contact to the provision for the bids that wants to speak to him uh, further. So from there, you know, we can only do so much in terms of uh, showcasing all the good work that's being done in the region. And I, yeah, explaining by science my approach to the industry program, putting the data and the resources that we all are developing. Um, in the, at the fingertips of, of the region, they can make their own judgments on whether or not um, there, there was a lack of response or monitoring. Yeah. And, and then the time I brought up, I was just to use my office to be uh, the services of, of our vessel um, to take anyone out who wants to understand our monitoring. Um, not just the users, but the technology managers as well. And, you know, perhaps we can work on organizing and stuff like that. Certainly, any of your new administrator or any of the administrators uh, would be welcome to work on that. I don't know that the team will pick us up on that, but we certainly welcome as well. But I think, and of course, we have to do it with them with a little bunch of and all of that. But I think we would. Maybe be a good opportunity to uh, and show them hands on what we do and, and how we do it and how we're all going to do it. Anybody that you have from that photo I'm going to say, when you work for the year,
town here, you know, and, you know, the undivided swimming is off. So maybe some of us who are alumni who are. Um, so, uh, is the Doug, yeah, Doug Rose is frequently down there too, as far as um, that, you know, he and I are usually, you know, when we're invited to speak, we're usually down there at the same event, so we can all go, you know, to dinner with the party portfolio and the men's history. I think there's a lot of us in the area that help oh, students um, from an organizational perspective of coming. Hey, <laughs> we've been to school here. Well, I mean, we haven't been. Any other, any other comments or concerns on this issue? 